a, a very good uh, program involving yet another uh, Mississippi political figure. And it occurs to me uh, there was a term that Bill Clinton used called triangulation that uh, involved bringing disparate forces together for one purpose. And we're dealing with three uh, Ole Miss uh, alums in this program, uh, Senator Jim Eastland, and then uh, our two guests here on the, uh, the program today. So uh, we're delighted to have back on campus to my left, Martin Zviers, uh, and I hope I don't butcher his uh, name too badly. He's a former student of mine nearly 10 years ago here when he was getting his uh, master's in Southern studies. And uh, uh, Martin is from the Netherlands, and uh, but uh, we consider him very much part of the Ole Miss family. And we're delighted to have him back here as author of uh, this biography of Senator James Eastland. Uh, Martin is uh, still uh, on the university campuses, but he's back in the Netherlands at his alma mater. I'll probably butcher this too, but the University of Groningen, if that's close enough in the Netherlands. Uh, Martin, great to have you back. And uh, to the far left is my friend and Ole Miss alum, Jim Abbott, who for years was editor of the uh, Indianola Enterprise Toxin in uh, Indianola in Sunflower County, the home of Senator Jim Eason. So I can't think of anybody better to carry on this conversation with Martin than Jim. So gentlemen, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks for being here today. <laughs> Thank you, Curtis. Uh, it's a treat for me to be up here, especially with this scholar. Uh, you know, just like uh, some of you who are as old as I am, and not many of you here, uh, growing up here in Mississippi, uh, I've been intrigued about this uh, almost mystical person for many, for many years, uh, Big Jim. And uh, Martin, your book has really helped, I think, pull back the curtain uh, on this somewhat Wizard of Oz type uh, uh, Cheshire Cat type, uh, Jabba the Hutt type, <laughs> powerful Mississippi uh, politician. And, uh, you know, he was a really interesting historical uh, uh, Mississippi character. And this is a well-written book, Martin. It Thank you. It really, really is. Uh, but before we delve into the contents, I'd like to ask you, uh, you from the northern part of the Netherlands, uh, how did you pick Jim Eastland to write about? Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, uh, I came to Mississippi in, in 2005, and uh, I had done an exchange at, at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, and uh, I really liked it there. I, I liked the South. And uh, so I wanted to know more about this region, and especially I'm fascinated by the political culture of the Southern states, and especially its transformation from you know, the Democrats to the Republicans, because if you think about the South right now, you don't think of Democrats at all. Um, so that's something I wanted to explore, and I thought, well, if you want to start the South, then Mississippi is the best place to be, right? In the, the deep South of, of the United States. So, um, so I came here in 2005, and I hadn't heard about Jim Eastland at all. Uh, I knew about Lyndon Johnson and, and George Wallace uh, of Alabama, the, these famous politicians. But uh, Jim Eastland didn't ring a bell until I got a job in the, uh, in the archives here uh, at Political Papers, where I had to uh, start uh, processing his speeches. So each day, I would go to the library, J.D. Williams Library. I would go to uh, uh, the first floor, so down the stairs. And they have federal collections there. And I had to pull out the whole volume of uh, um, uh, congressional record speeches. And then I had to start copying the speeches of Senator Eastland. Yeah, so I did that for half a year. He'd been in the Senate for 37 years, so I was copying there for two hours each morning. And, uh, and then I had to go uh, to the archives and uh, compare his drafts, so the drafts of his speeches, with the actual things he said on the, on the Senate floor. And uh, I didn't really like a job, sorry, Lee. Uh, but um, I learned a lot about, about uh, Jim Eastland. 
And I thought, well, you know, this collection just opened up in 2006. This is the first time an historian has a chance to look at these records. So uh, this was a great opportunity. And uh, if you look at his career, he was in the Senate from 1941 till 1978. So that's exactly the period I was interested in. So all these things sort of came together with Big Jim Eastland. And then uh, I wrote my master's thesis about him. Uh, that became my PhD dissertation. And now it's, it's a book. So it's sort of you know, an interest in, in southern politics with a little bit of coincidence and luck mixed together. Tell us a little bit about the, the Eastland collection. Mm -hmm. It's here on this campus. Yeah. It, it must be huge. I uh -huh. mean, it's a, a lot of boxes, I assume. Wh where, where is the collection? Uh, in the it, library? Well, it's over at the, at the annex, uh, where all the political papers are at. Um, I don't know how many boxes. It's over a thousand boxes, I guess. Lee, how, how many? OK, well, <laughs> it's a lot of boxes, yeah? <laughs> it's, I think about 1,800 linear feet or something. Ooh. So um, it's, it's a huge collection. And, um, and there's a danger right there, because uh, if you just delve in and start you know, reading letters and, and don't really have a research plan, then you get lost easily. Happened to me once. Uh, I was in the archives from 9 till 5, from Monday till Thursday, and, you know, and then you really you don't want to look at those letters anymore, and you sort of grow immune to the rhetoric of his speeches. So, um, so it's a huge collection. It's it, it's over at the annex, um, which is which is like northeast of the uh, uh, the scoreboard. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so kind it's, it's near, over near at the, the stadium. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, your book uh, follows uh, mostly his life chronologically. Mm -hmm. uh, so, could could you tell us a little bit about the family? Or, or in which he was born, and a little bit about his early life. Yeah. Um, well, his, uh, his father had a big plantation in the Mississippi Delta uh, near uh, uh, Ruleville. And um, he also had a, uh, a law practice in Forest, and that's in Scott County in the Hill Country. So there's, he sort of had two home bases, one in the Delta, the, the family plantation, and then uh, the house in Forest. And, uh, and that's kind of interesting if you think about uh, the different cultures here in Mississippi, right? Because there was uh, a division between the Delta, where the, the big plantations were at, and then uh, the hill country where the, uh, uh, the, the poor farmers were living. So and he grew up, grew up in, in those two cultures. But his family was, uh, was, was wealthy, and uh, his dad also had a, a huge political network, which also helped uh, Jim Eastland to get uh, elected. And he goes to school here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. He goes to Ole Miss for a couple of years. Um, then he transfers to Vanderbilt University, uh, goes to law school there, and then uh, to the University of Alabama. Um, he doesn't finish law school, but he passes the bar. It's still possible, I guess, at that point that you don't finish your degree, but still can become a lawyer, right? And then he runs for uh, the House, uh, State House, for the first time in 1927. Okay. And so in 1941, he becomes a United States mm -hmm. senator. How, yeah. how did that happen? And what, how, how old was he? Um, he's from 1904, so uh, darn it, uh, 30. No, wait a second. I'm really bad at math. Like this kind of stuff I can't do, especially yeah, yeah. on the stage here. <laughs> Pretty <laughs> so young. 30, uh, darn it. So how did, well, he be, how did he become senator? 37. Huh? How did he become senator? Uh, funny story, uh, Pat Harrison dies, he's the, 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 well that's not funny of course that somebody dies, but Pat Harrison, he, uh, he passes away and uh, he's the senior senator for Mississippi at that point. And um, in Mississippi, I think it's still the case that when a senator dies, the governor has the power to appoint uh, a replacement until special elections could be organized. So um, uh, Paul Johnson was a good friend of Woods Eastland, Jim Easton's dad. So he calls up uh, Woods and he says, you have to come to the, uh, uh, to the governor's mansion here in, in Jackson and uh, also bring Jim. And uh, Governor Johnson at that point offered the post to Woods Eastland. And uh, Woods says, um, I'm not going to do it. Uh, the boy will do it. <laughs> yeah? So Jim had to go to, uh, to Washington. And that's the start of his political career. Yeah. So it's uh, the it's again these backroom politics that also play an important role in his uh, in his further career. Yeah. You sort of touched on this, but uh, you write that uh, that James Eastland uh, learned the game of politics in two distinct 
political cultures, mm -hmm. uh, the Mississippi Delta and the Hills. Mm -hmm. uh, and you write, quote, the Delta and the Hill Country represented two different states of mind. Could you kind of expound on mm -hmm. that just a little bit? And, and, uh, and you write that he began playing uh, different roles like in a theater. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, this, this, this theater metaphor is kind of central to this book. It's, um, it's sort of wearing masks and, and playing roles, yeah? So he, um, um, uh, Eastland in Washington is a different Eastland than the one that comes to Mississippi to campaign for re-election and who speaks at these segregationist organizations down here. Um, and I think his upbringing plays an important role in that because, uh, because he is from these two distinct cultures, yeah, from forest in the hill country and from the delta, um, he can change sort of his, you know, political persona. And uh, if you think about the political history of Mississippi, you had these rich delta planters in the, uh, 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 in the west of the country, of, of the state right next to the, to the Mississippi River. Um, and these, uh, these planters were, of course, racist in their beliefs, but at the same time, they sort of had this planter mentality, you know, we have to be not as outspoken in our racism. Uh, we have to make sure that we have enough people who want to work on our plantations, and that were, uh, uh, most of them were African Americans. While in the hill country, uh, that's where the poor farmers were at, and these farmers were not as uh, moderate in their racism, so it's much more outspoken there. And that's also where these demagogues were really popular, like Vardaman and, um, and uh, Theodore Bilbo. Yeah, so they kind of hated the, uh, the Delta establishment. Yeah, you, see, you still see that, I think, in Mississippi with the uh, competition between Ole Miss and, and Mississippi State University, uh, that uh, the University of Mississippi presents itself as sort of the Harvard of the South, and Mississippi State, the folks with the, co with the cowbells, huh? that's the, uh, uh, the redneck image. And I think that also comes out of that, that sort of that culture. Um, but Eastland could play both roles really well. Yeah, so on the one hand, he had this outspoken racism. On the other hand, he could also be the, plant, the, the, the gentleman planter. And uh, you know, when he was working with his committee, he could be the benevolent planter, for instance. But when he came down to Mississippi, he could campaign as this outspoken segregationist uh, um, demagogue. In, in uh, 45, so he's only been up there about mm -hmm. four years, uh, and he, he spoke on the floor of the Senate uh, criticizing the Fair Employment Practices Committee, mm -hmm. FEPC, which was set up to prevent discrimination mm -hmm. uh, on the basis of race, color, creed, or national origin. For, for instance, if a company had a, a defense contract, they had to follow, follow these rules, and Eastland railed about that, uh, 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 about their supposed communist uh, nature. Uh, and, you, and you wrote about that. And he made some pretty strong statements about uh, blacks mm -hmm. on the floor, uh, floor of the Senate. And what, what, what's the fallout of that? Uh, mm -hmm. Well, this is, so 1945 is, is the end of, of the Second World War. And the FEPC was set up to, um, to help the war industry. Yeah? So, um, and uh, also to do something about segregation in, in, uh, in, uh, in factories. Uh, this is an, a, a measure that was taken by Roosevelt in, uh, in 1941. And in 1945, they have a debate about the continuation of the FEPC. And then Eastland gets on the floor of the United States Senate, and he holds a speech um, that is really critical of um, the functioning of black soldiers in the Second World War. He was like, they're all cowards, and they didn't want to fight. And uh, we don't have to uh, provide these people with anti-discrimination measures uh, when they uh, come back. Um, the FPC is, is interesting because it's, it sort of combines this anti-labor position of Eastland and his racism. Yeah, what Delta planters like Eastland were afraid of was the uh, destruction of the status quo in Mississippi. And so it was not just about uh, the destruction of segregation that they were afraid of. They were also afraid that uh, workers would rise up against, you know, uh, the elite having control over a lot of econ economic uh, things in uh, in Mississippi. So uh, you always have to keep in mind that these race and and class issues are very much interconnected for people like Eastland. Yeah. And um, uh, so he gets on the floor. He 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 has his speech, and then 
at the end of the speech, he says, you know, I'm, I'm not a racist. And the entire Senate floor bursts out in laughter, of course, because he just get, he made one of the most racist speeches ever held on the Senate floor, I think. So. Uh, you, you write about the Dixiecrats and the mm -hmm. Dixiecrat revoked in 1948. Uh, briefly, could you explain mm -hmm. what went on there? Yeah. And Eastland's involvement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, one, one more thing about the, the whole racist segregationist part. What, what Eastland believed is that, you know, uh, that it, perhaps he really believed he was not a racist, uh, but he said those things because he thought that segregation was beneficial for black people too. So you could claim that you're for segregation because he believed that this was good for black and white. Yeah? So and that's, nobody wants to be called a racist, not even people who are in favor of segregation. So uh, that's sort of his way out. But you know, segregation is inherently racist, of course. And, um, and that was also central to the, uh, to the Dixiecrat revolt of 1948. Uh, in 1948, sort of the first year that uh, the National Democratic Party decides to uh, adopt a really progressive civil rights plank in its uh, platform yeah, with Harry Truman. And of course, people like Eastland did not like this. Yeah? Eastland was in the Democratic Party, which was a dominant party in the South at that point, coming out of Reconstruction. And uh, uh, so uh, Eastland and the whole Mississippi delegation walks out of that convention. They're waving the Confederate flag, and they walk out of the convention hall into the pouring rain. And uh, they regrouped two days later in Birmingham, Alabama. And that's where they organized their own party, uh, the States' Rights Democratic Party. And uh, these Dixiecrats thought that they could organize uh, the South, so the 127 electoral votes of the Southern States, and that they could, uh, so that they could decide the presidential election. Yeah? So they were trying to play a kingmaker role in that election. And that doesn't really work out. Uh, they only win uh, five states. And uh, so and that's the end of the Dixiecrat revolt. But again, uh, the, the Dixiecrats were a party that was very much into segregation, but also very much into free enterprise and as less government interference as possible. So with the states' rights Democrats, you again see this fusion of uh, economics with racist policies. And uh, in 1954, the <clears throat> Supreme Court hands down the, uh, the Brown versus mm -hmm. Board of Education decision declaring racial segregation in public schools as unconstitutional. Uh, you document uh, how that provided a big boost to Eastland's career, mm -hmm. uh, an irony, you say. Uh, talk about that. Yeah. Just a minute. Okay, so after the Dixiecrat Revolt of 1948, uh, Eastland uh, returns to, uh, to the Democratic Party. Yeah? And that's also the moment he realizes all these third party uh, efforts, that's not gonna win, us for, uh, win it for us. So we have to be part of the political establishment. So he gets back into the Democratic Party and, uh, and that's kind of difficult for him because a lot of his constituents are like, okay, uh, Senator Eastland, you campaigned in 1948 as a Dixiecrat now you're back in a Democratic Party campaigning for the National Democratic ticket. You know, how does that work? So he has to explain himself a lot in 1952 with the presidential election. And he's like, well, you know, uh, Adley Stevenson, the Democratic candidate, and Eisenhower, they're both good men. But I think it's important that people vote the Democratic Party so we can stay in power. So this whole party affiliation thing becomes uh, an issue for him to, to explain himself. Yeah, you betray the Democratic Party as a Dixiecrat, and then you return to it, and how does that work? So in 1954, and that's, that's the irony of that decision, um, of the Supreme Court decision in Brown versus Board of Education, uh, it's the thing Eastland feared the most. Yeah, the desegregation of public education. Now little white children had to go to school with little black children. That's something Eastland did not like at all. Um, so the thing he feared most actually boosts his career uh, because now he can redirect these attacks he was making on a Democratic Party um, towards the Supreme Court, which is sort of outside the political the party establishment. Yeah? So at that point, he can say, you know, we don't have to worry about party affiliation anymore. It doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or a Republican. What matters most now is that you keep electing me into Congress so I can fight the Supreme Court. 
Yeah? So that's the irony of, of the, uh, the Brown versus Board of Education decision of 54. In your chapter, uh, The Politics of Compromise, mm -hmm. you explain about practical segregationists mm -hmm. and massive resistors. Yeah. Uh, who were these and in what camp did Eastland fall? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the concept of, of compromise is also something that's important in this book because uh, if you know a little bit about Eastland, and he's mostly forgotten nowadays, uh, Eastland was known as this hardline segregationist. Yeah, he always promised, I'm not going to compromise on my beliefs. Um, but I think that compromise was very important to him and that kept him in power. Yeah, so he was saying things in the state and then he would go up to Washington in the back rooms of you know, a dark restaurant, a bit like House of Cards, kind of, you know, that, that setting. Um, he would make deals. And um, with the, uh, uh, the politics of compromise and, and mass resistance versus practical segregation, uh, in the 50s, you had two factions uh, that fought for segregation. You, on the one hand, you had massive resistance, uh, which were people uh, that believed, you know, we have to, if necessary, we're going to abolish the public schools here. And uh, we have to fight segregation till the end, and we have to be really outspoken about it. So that's the camp Eastland belonged to. Yeah. So these are the radicals in the fight for segregation. Um, the practical segregationists were the people more like James Coleman, who was the, the governor of, of Mississippi uh, starting in 1955, uh, John Stennis, the other U.S. senator, um, and these people thought, well, you know, we have to keep segregation. So the commitment to segregation was there, uh, but at the same time they wanted to downplay this issue. So don't talk about it, you know, and, and keep all these uh, these massive resistance protests uh, under on the cover. Yeah. So that's the the difference there. In '56, he becomes the chairman mm -hmm. of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Yeah. Had a lot of seniority. Mm -hmm. How important? I think that's the well. That that's the key moment almost in his in his life that he uh, becomes chairman of the Judiciary Committee. Uh, the um, uh, the Judiciary Committee is the committee that deals with civil rights. Yeah. So now you have this Senator Jim Eastland, uh, one of the strongest defenders of segregation, becoming the chairman of the committee that deals with civil rights legislation. So there was a lot of protest against that uh, coming out of uh, civil rights movements. And um, uh, it's, it's interesting to see how they make that decision to, to nominate Eastland uh, to the chairmanship of this committee because it's a, it's a party decision. So they have a meeting, the steering group has a meeting. Uh, Lyndon Johnson would chair that meeting, but he's away in Texas. So, uh, and you can read all these, uh, the, uh, uh, the notes of this meeting, they're all here also in the archives. Uh, so it's really interesting to read how that decision-making process went. Yeah, because there are senators who say, you know, we shouldn't have Jim Eastland as a chair uh, because of his record. Uh, while others are saying, well, you know, if he becomes the chairman of this committee, he perhaps has to tone down his segregationist uh, uh, talk. Yeah? So eventually they decided to give him the chairmanship, and it is based on this uh, concept of seniority. Uh, in the Senate, if you stay long enough in the US Senate, you will gain power. Yeah? So it, he was elected in 1941, or appointed in 1941. So he had been in the Senate for 15 years, and on the basis of that, he could become the uh, the chairman of the uh, Judiciary Committee. And uh, once he was in that position, he could really say, you know, it's now I'm the chairman, and now I have the power over civil rights legislation. And when he would go on the campaign trail, he would always tell his, pe his the people who were there, his audience, I've got special pockets in my, in my pants and in my jacket where I put all these civil rights bills in. Yeah, so they don't, are not being discussed. Once they come into my committee, it's over. Uh, in, in 57, the first civil rights mm -hmm. bill passes, since Reconstruction. Mm -hmm. uh, then in 61, John F. Kennedy becomes president. Yeah. Was there support from Southern senators like Eastland uh, for uh, John Kennedy? And, and you write that, that, uh, that John Kennedy was, quote, reluctantly engaged in civil mm -hmm. rights. Uh, explain, explain that. Yeah. What? Well, w first with the 1957 civil rights bill, uh, I mean, he was promising that 
no civil rights bill would ever pass. Uh, in 1957, the Congress does institute a, a civil rights act, but it's, it's a very weak uh, civil rights bill. And it's also, again, because uh, at that point, uh, the Southerners in Congress realized that they can't block this bill uh, because Eisenhower is the president and the Civil Rights Act is coming out of a Republican administration, which means that they don't have their old allies, the conservatives in the Republican Party, helping them. So that's why they, at that point, decide, okay, now we have to make sure that this bill is as weak as possible. And that's, they succeed in that. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an important act, but at the same time, it's a very uh, weak act. And Kennedy was also involved, actually, in, uh, in the 1957 uh, uh, Civil Rights Act, and he takes an ambivalent position in that debate about this act. Yeah? On the one hand, he wants to attract black voters to his uh, uh, candidacy for the 1960 uh, presidential election. At the same time, he wants to keep these uh, segregationists happy. And, and Kennedy, if you think of Kennedy, you always have this idea, you know, this is this liberal president and uh, sort of, uh, you know, died at this prime when he got shot in, in Dallas in 1963. Uh, but, but Kennedy was not really interested, when he became president, to deal with civil rights. He wanted to, uh, to fight uh, the Soviet Union, yeah, uh, win the Cold War. He was much more interested in international politics and not so much in, uh, in civil rights. At least that's, uh, that's my opinion. Um, for Kennedy, uh, he became president at the moment that the civil rights movement becomes much more activist in its protests against segregation at the beginning of the 1960s. Um, with the sit-ins, uh, the freedom rights in 1961, and uh, the integration of, of Ole Miss in, uh, in 1962, and then Alabama in, uh, in 1963. So uh, the feeling I get is that, that Kennedy, you know, these things were sort of forced on him, and he had to deal with, uh, these, uh, with the escalation of civil rights protests. Uh, but the way he deals with it is, is, is weird, because he, he doesn't help civil rights activists, at least not at the beginning, he goes to Jim Eastland and starts talking to him. You know, how are we going to solve this problem here in the South, and how do we keep things down there? Yeah, so there's a, a sort of a cooperation between John F. Kennedy and people like Eastland. They got along well together. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Senator East, uh, excuse me, no, uh, President Kennedy mm -hmm. and, and Bobby Kennedy and Ross Barnett were yeah. deeply involved mm -hmm in the situation that happened here at Ole Miss in, in 1962. In your uh, looking in the Eastland collection, mm -hmm. did you find any examples that he was involved behind the scenes in the Ole Miss crisis? Or? Uh, well, in, in 1961, with Freedom Riders, he was very much involved in solving that, that crisis. Yeah, Bobby Kennedy was on the phone all the time with, uh, with Eastland. And, um, in Alabama, there had been a lot of violence of white segregationists um, uh, attacking the, the, the freedom riders coming through Alabama. And that was something the Kennedy administration wanted to avoid in, uh, in Mississippi. So they got on the phone with, uh, with Jim Eastland, and he sort of makes sure that uh, they're being placed under uh, uh, national uh, guard protection, and they're driven to Jackson, and then they're being all put into jail. So no massive uh, protest there thanks to, uh, to, to Big Jim Eastland. And then in, in 1962, I had a feeling that Kennedy sort of overplayed his hand there and uh, thought that he could deal with Governor Barnett by his own and don't get Eastland too involved into all of this. And that goes horribly wrong. I, I guess you've heard the story about Ross Barnett coming up with all these Wild West scenarios that he wants the uh, uh, the U.S. Marshals to pull guns on him so he can stand in, in the schoolhouse door like George Wallace a year later and, uh, and then surrender. Um, so things really spin out of control and, and Eastland not only blames uh, Kennedy but also blames Ross Burnett, you know, that he let this happen. And he sort of, I mean, I talked to one of his assistants, uh, Clarence Pierce, uh, Eastland's assistants, and uh, I had the feeling that uh, Barnett at this point sort of went behind Eastland's back and uh, tried to solve things on his own. Yeah. And it's also, I think, kind of a power play that Eastland perhaps was like, okay, well, you know, s see what happens if you, Kennedy, if you deal with Barnett by yourself, and, uh, and well, obviously, the bad, well, I don't want to say bad, but bad things happen down here, yeah. After President Kennedy was assassinated in 63, mm -hmm. 
uh, Lyndon Johnson becomes president, mm -hmm. uh, a longtime Senate friend of Eastland's. Um, and then they have the 64 Democrat convention. Briefly, briefly, tell us a little bit about Eastland's involvement in that convention and what went on there. Yeah, okay. Um, well, Eastland, uh, the last national convention Eastland attends is the one in, uh, in LA in 1960. Um, in 1964, he's not there in Atlantic City, but this is, of course, the convention that the uh, Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party is trying to be recognized as the official Democratic Party of Mississippi. And, and Johnson, again, tries to come up with a compromise. Yeah, so again, the, the compromise is right there. And, and that's the point that uh, the civil rights movement here in Mississippi uh, really loses um, sort of trust in the Democratic Party because they thought, well, you know, we're working with these Democrats, but um, at that point they realized, you know, we can't get in, we can't be part of the system. And um, if the system is oppressing you, well, then you eventually want to destroy the system. Yeah? So this sort of explains the radicalization also of the uh, civil rights movement. Uh, Eason was not there, but Johnson uh, calls him up. Uh, I think he's out in Kentucky somewhere in a hunt hunting cabin uh, sitting around there. Uh, he understood that, okay, I, don't wanna, I, don't, I should not be in Atlantic City at this moment, right? Uh, so he is in Kentucky, and uh, uh, Johnson tries to make Eastland talk to Paul Johnson, who's the governor of Mississippi, to get things under control, yeah, so that the regular Democrats, the segregationist Democrats, also accept the compromise. Uh, doesn't really work out, and, um, and that's really the moment that you see the, the, the downfall of the Democratic Party start here in the South, yeah, with the, uh, the Goldwater campaign of 1964. First time uh, Republicans, uh, the Republican Party uh, wins the uh, the Deep South at that point, yeah. and um, and that's also sort of the end of my uh, of my book. Uh, yeah, uh, well, we, you know, we, uh, we had the landmark Civil Rights Acts mm -hmm. of sixty four and sixty five, mm -hmm. and and then comes sixty six, and that that's as you say, that's about when your book, the detailed part of the mm -hmm. politics and of of Jim Eastland, the focus that you have, yeah. kind of comes to a close. But much is happening, mm -hmm. and, uh, and to Southern Democrats and to Eastland, uh, uh, in, the, in the conclusion chapter of your book, as you mentioned, Eastland deciding to retire in 1978, mm -hmm. uh, not being up for another Senate race, uh, and how uh, the Mississippi Republicans that you just mentioned benefited. What continues uh, mm -hmm. in his life? Uh, yeah. There. Um, okay. Well, the, the book is really about the uh, uh, the 1950s till and and then till the mid 1960s. And the question I'm interested in was, you know, how do these Southern Democrats stay politically effective within a party structure that becomes uh, more liberal after the Second World War? You know, that was sort of the the puzzle I was trying to solve. And uh, I think the question is that both sides after this 1948 Dixiecrat revolt understood that they have to, had to compromise a little bit. Yeah? So the Democratic Party gives in to its civil rights program and uh, the Southern Democrats also uh, are open to, to compromise behind the scenes. Yeah, so, so that's uh, what the book is about, and uh, because the Democratic Party does not really know how to deal with these Southern segregationists in the 1950s and 1960s, are we going to kick them out? Uh, what are we going to do with them? Uh, by 1965, Eastland is really well entrenched in, in national politics. Yeah, he's a really powerful figure. Uh, he's the chairman of the Judiciary Committee. Uh, he's very powerful on the Agricultural Committee and uh, also on the uh, Internal Security Subcommittee. So he combines all these elements that are central to, to white Mississippians, yeah? the, the, uh, the defense of segregation, uh, agriculture, and anti-communism. And so by uh, uh, 1965, uh, he is well entrenched in national politics. At the same time, the civil rights movement, uh, having achieved its biggest victories in the South with uh, civil rights and, and voting rights decides to move north and address a lot of structural discrimination uh, that's present not just in the South but also in the rest of the United States. And then you're talking about housing and uh, uh, education yeah, and those kind of things. And those problems are much more difficult to solve. And, uh, and then uh, these riots erupt in the big cities in, in the north, yeah, in Watts and in, in Los Angeles and Detroit. 
And, and that's the moment Eastern says, you know, now the rest of, of America sees what the civil rights movement is up to. You know, that was his idea that the civil rights movement wanted to destroy America. Yeah, this was an un-American uh, uh, movement. And, um, and then uh, that's also the moment that his sort of his vision almost comes, becomes reality because he thought that uh, Americans in the South and Americans in, white Americans in the North, uh, that they all thought the same about, about the race question. So, um, and, and that's also what he writes in 1966 when the 1966 uh, Civil Rights Act uh, does not pass, which contains a fair housing uh, uh, chapter. Uh, that's the moment he says, you know, the pendulum is now swinging back towards more conservatism in the United States. And um, so this structural change uh, does not happen, um, also because both the Democrats and the Republicans are not really trying to, um, to to, uh, to listen to the demands of African Americans at that point. A, a few, uh, few more questions, and we're going to open it up uh -huh. uh, to the audience here. But uh, since we're here in the journalism uh, department, Eastland in the media, mm -hmm. uh, did your research reveal any animosities uh, between the two? And uh, did he ever use his power to investigate or intimidate? The media mm -hmm. that you saw. Well, and he, he tries to investigate the New York Times in, in, in the 1950s, and and what's also interesting is that um, you know this morality also comes into politics during his career. Uh, in the 1950s, he's involved in banning uh, Lady Chatterley's lover, uh, you know, because there's a. Uh, uh, anyways, uh, not <laughs> um, And um, but he was not really into uh, media appearances. He was somebody who yeah. did not really uh, like to do interviews. Um, by the 1970s, uh, campaigns start changing. Yeah, these old style political campaigns you had here in the South that the politician would come and there would be a big barbecue and people eat catfish and fried chicken and, and there would be a, a country band and, and you know, there was all far and easy like that, I guess, to a certain extent. But uh, by the 1970s, he had to do these television commercials and, um, well, I, you can you can watch them, and it's it's really horrible because he it's <laughs> you almost start to feel sorry for him because he he can't really uh, you know address the issues and he's sort of shy I think and um, so this is really old style an old style politician that was good at dealing wheeling and dealing in the back rooms, but not really geared to this. PR campaigns that become uh, uh, very prominent in the 70s, uh, you know, up until up until now. You uh, you almost alluded to this a minute ago, but in, in your foraging foraging through those those many boxes of the Eastland coll collection, did you come across any strange or surprising uh, items like an old cigar, an old, <laughs> old picture of? Of uh, Justice uh, Earl Warren with dart holes in it, or or something. What did you? Uh, well, I heard the story once that they found like a, uh, like or, uh, what was it? Granola, granola bar from the 1960s, I think, in there. That someone was probably like, putting stuff in the box and <laughs> threw a granola bar in there. Uh, but yeah, I'm not not that familiar. Perhaps Lee has some nicer stories about that. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, uh, what I did, with the speeches, I didn't find any any weird stuff. I would say. But, but, okay. Uh, you probably come across weird stuff if you really want to look. I mean, back in the day, when the law school was still over there, they used to have the Eastland room there because uh, the law library was named after Jim Eastland up until they moved it to the, to the new building. And they had a room there just like in presidential libraries, you have these uh, replicas of the Oval Office. Well, they had sort of the Eastland office there uh, with his desk and uh, with the phone and, and, and like his chair and all that. So uh, it was kind of fun to, uh, to look at. Uh, but that's all, uh, all gone now. That, that's not in the new law building? No, no. no. That, that leads me into this. Uh, I, I noticed that, I personally noticed that there are few things in Mississippi that honor to Senator mm -hmm. Eastland. Hardly any buildings carry his name, unlike Senators Thad Cochran and Trent Lott, if you walk around this campus here. Uh, Eastland's longtime fellow Senator James, uh, excuse me, John Stennis, uh, is, his name is on uh, the NASA's Senate's, uh, uh, Stennis Space Center mm -hmm. and on the USS John Stennis uh, nuclear-powered aircraft carrier. What was different about 
in your opinion, these two men that ended up with this difference in the way that they were viewed? Yeah. Well, you could say that Stannis was a bit more moderate, uh, perhaps in his, uh, you know, in his political style. Uh, but at the same time, these two guys were just as committed to segregation, um, you know, as any as George Wallace, for instance, right? Um, so th they didn't differ in in their commitment to keeping Jim Crow alive. It's just the way they talked about it. Uh, John Stennis was very much into this constitutional argument. Yeah, we we don't want the federal government in our lives because it's not constitutional. While Eastland was really, you know, that segregation is the, the, the best system, social system you can have. So he's, he's much more outspoken in his racism, and I think that's also the reason why he is not uh, uh, remembered the way we remember John Stennis, although um, John Stennis also signed the Southern Manifesto in 1956. Yeah, he joined the Dixiecrat Party in 1948. Um, so you have to, I think that's something you have to realize when you, when you hear these names about the Stennis Space Center, um, that in their ideology, they weren't that different, especially not in the 1940s and, and 1950s, I think. So, um, and, and Stennis was, I think, more able to adapt to the changing times than, uh, than Jim Eastland. Uh, I mean, you have the story, right, that, that I told you this, that if, if John Stennis would have a restaurant and Jim Eastland would have a restaurant, uh, if an African-American person would walk up to the restaurant and say, I'd like to eat here, Easton would say, um, you can't sit here because you're black. And John Stennis would say, I'm sorry, we're full now, but perhaps you can come back another time. Yeah, so that's the difference in style right there. Uh, they both mean the same thing, but they will frame it differently. And, uh, yeah. Can we open it up for some questions? Y'all have some questions for Martin? Yeah. Um, and, and you also came from the Netherlands in 2005. Um, I was curious what drew you into studying Southern politics? What, um, what was the motivation behind that? <laughs> uh, it's, uh, you have to go back to my childhood days to uh, uh, American uh, uh, television series are very popular in, in the Netherlands. And in the 1980s, you had this series called North and South with Patrick Swayze. <laughs> and uh, uh, rest in peace. Uh, and he, um, uh, th this was about the U.S. Civil War, so that's how I got interested in um, in American history. And I started collecting all this stuff about about the Civil War. And uh, I re was really interested in, in when I got into college, really interested in the Confederacy. You know, this, this, the paradoxes in the South interest me. That uh, on the one hand. You know, the people in the Confederate States also claimed that they were fighting for liberty and freedom, uh, but they also had slavery. So how do you combine those two things? And Eastland is also sort of that, that such a character. Uh, you know, uh, he was talking about freedom and democracy, but at the same time, he was defending an extremely racist system. Yeah, so how can they combine those two things? Um, and <coughs> uh, I was going to say something else about the... Uh, um, I, perhaps I'll, I'll think about it. Oh, no, wait, uh, yeah, with the, the Democratic Party, at that point, uh, in, in Dutch politics, there were a couple of uh, conservative politicians who went against the party line, uh, and so they were kicked out of their party. And uh, that never happened to Eastland, and a lot of these Southern Democrats could stay in a Democratic Party, although they didn't vote for their program. So that's also something I wanted to, uh, to figure out. So how does that work? So those two things. Um, he stayed in the Senate after after American Justice Well, his last campaign was in uh, 1972 when he was running against uh, Gil Carmichael, who was a fairly moderate Republican, and, and Carmichael um, and really tried to also attract black people to the Republican Party at that point. Um, and he wins that election with, I think, 60% of the, of the vote. Um, in the 1970s, he, he hires, uh, I think, one black person on his staff. And, uh, and, and, I mean, there's a story that in 1978, he's again thinking about running for re-election. And then he meets with Aaron Henry, who's the, uh, the chairman of the, uh, of the state Democratic Party at that point. And he asks him, you know, do you think I have a chance now? And, uh, and then Aaron Henry tells him, well, I don't think so, because you have this master-servant relationship to, to black people here. And 
Uh, and that's the thing I was talking about a minute ago with Jan Stennis. I think he was much more able to, to uh, because he was not as outspoken in his racism, that he could attract the uh, uh, African American vote, which becomes very popular in, uh, 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 important in the 70s and 80s, right, for Southern Democrats that they uh, are able to, uh, to form these biracial coalitions uh, of not just white people, but also uh, uh, black people. The other? Yeah, and I know the, the story behind that. I'm not, I'm not sure that uh, of if the deal actually happened, but I did come across uh, letters between Kennedy and Harold Cox from 1959 that actually Kennedy was already corresponding with Harold Cox before he became president of the United States. So I'm not sure that if if Kennedy had to give in much, you know what I'm saying, that, that he was already um, in touch with Cox at that point and that this deal, uh, what you're talking about, wasn't really a deal at all, but that, that Kennedy didn't really mind that Cox became the, uh, uh, John F. Kennedy at least. Uh, Bobby Kennedy had some hesitations, I think, and he had to do an interview with, uh, with him. Um, but I, I didn't find any evidence that this, this conversation uh, actually took place, because that's what, you know, I will give you uh, Marshall and if you give me Cox, right? Um, uh, Easton, uh, that's another story that he was also rewarded because he did such a good job on, uh, on getting that omnibus judgeship bill passed uh, right at the beginning of the Kennedy administration. So, uh, so that's another way to, uh, to look at it. Among the people who promoted that story is no less a historian than Arthur Schlesinger Jr. Mm -hmm. in his book on Robert Kennedy. Mm -hmm. it's, not a, it's not an idle rumor. No, no. <laughs> no, but uh, what I'm trying to say here that is that um, but John Kennedy is, is uh, uh, that he was not as opposed to Cox as perhaps Arthur Schlesinger tries to, to, to picture here. You know, Schlesinger was also very much involved in the, in the Kennedy administration, of course. Uh, so, um, I mean, I can show you the letter uh, Cox was, uh, wrote to, uh, to John Kennedy. He was really sorry that he didn't have a chance to meet Kennedy here in, uh, in Mississippi when he came over. So, um, yeah. It's kind of interesting, the, uh, the Democratic Party and the early to mid 60s having such trouble with these right wing uh, southerners in the party and trying to figure out what to do with them. And now the Republican Party today is having the same problem, particularly in the House. Mm -hmm. well, they can't elect a speaker because they tr we've got the, the Tea Partiers from the South there. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Yeah. Um, and we talked about that too, right? Um, how Eastland would deal with the Tea Party. I mean, I guess Eastland would not be able to operate in this political climate uh, because he was he was making deals all the time with the president, and and this is something. Uh, and John Boehner tried to. And I mean, John Boehner is not uh, the most liberal politician, I think, and he gets kicked out. So I'm wondering what what would have happened to uh, to Jim Eastland uh, when he was would have been in the Senate uh, at this point um, with. Uh, um, uh, shit, I don't know what I was going to say. Well, anyways, it doesn't matter. I'm sorry. This one. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, Thad Cochran succeeded uh, Jim Eastland in 78. Yeah, it's a three-way race between uh, Evers and Mars Danton. So the Democratic vote gets split up, and that's when uh, Cochran came in. But I mean, you, this, uh, you've got these two factions, I think, still in, in Mississippi politics. That's sort of the, the Stennis school. That's more the, you know, the Cochran school right now. And, and then Trent Lott, who is also a bit more radical, I think, in his uh, conservatism. Um, I'm not sure if, if 
the uh, uh, perhaps Curtis, or you know more about that, how the relationship was with uh, Trent Lott and uh, and Jim Eastland, because I think Lott was the uh, he worked for Bill Calmer be before he became uh, a representative in in 1972, and um, and then he succeeds John Stennis in uh, in the 1980s. So, any more questions? Who's what? Andy. Yeah. Brad Dye, uh -huh. Governor. Yeah. Any Not really. No, I talked to. Uh, I mean, I, I talked to his family, and uh, I did the interview with uh, with Mr. Pierce out in in Vaden. Um, but what I wanted to do with this book was really more. Uh, um, I mean, it's it's a, it's a biography, so it's it's about his his uh, his life. But I actually really wanted to use his career to explain these bigger transformations in the South that were happening. So that's the thing I was much more interested in to. Uh, to see how these uh, uh, Democrats stayed politically effective uh, after the Second World War. And I more or less use his career as a case study. Well, I, I think he got he, he stayed. He, George Wallace has that moment that you know this road to Damascus kind of thing that uh, I did everything wrong. Uh, please forgive me, and and that he sings "We Shall Overcome" in, in the 1990s with uh, in this African American church. I don't see Eastland doing that, and I think at the uh, uh, <coughs> like one of his last interviews. What is that? Did you do that interview, Joe? With the that he said I voted my convictions on everything. You know that he that. Yeah, exactly. I wouldn't change anything, and so it's. Uh, I don't think he he had a lot of regret about the the, the his political career. Yeah, so uh, um, he wasn't really concerned about his his legacy, I think, or that he looked into the future and how will I be remembered. Yeah. He was thinking as a uh, as a Delta planter, I think, and uh, and that that was also his passion. Yeah, um, he. Uh, in 1950, in, at the beginning of 1950s, he actually wanted to return to the plantation and take up farming again and get out of politics. So um, uh, that was his priority. And that, that mindset, I don't think that, that really changed. I, can I just uh, mention that um, for, th for those of you students who are more interested in the Delta, uh, after hearing uh, Martin's presentation here, uh, uh, please remember that there are, and I think there are available copies of the uh, Meek School of Journalism's uh, excellent 132-page report, Land of Broken Promises, uh, that some of the top journalism students here a uh, year, year and a half ago uh, uh, put out. They, uh, did, they researched and wrote and photographed and laid out uh, this, and it's, uh, it's really excellent. Uh, edit editor and instructor Bill Rose was kind of the leader of that project, so uh, if you're interested in it. And Sunflower County, since we really didn't say at the very beginning, is kind of between uh, Washington and Bolivar County, Greenville, Cleveland, and LaFleur County, uh, uh, Greenwood. And uh, the county in the Eastland Plantation is right on the outskirts of Doddsville, which is in the very center, geographic center of Sunflower County. And uh, uh, the county, by the way, is the uh, home county of uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, famous civil rights activist, and Archie Manning dr dr grew up in Drew. Uh, uh, Craig Claiborne, the uh, longtime food editor of the New York Times, uh, is from uh, Sunflower County. B.B. King, of course, uh, author Steve Yarbrough, and uh, Parchment Penitentiary is is. Uh, North of Dodsville, north of Drew, there, and 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 the new fourteen million dollar BB King Museum is there in Indianola, and I would uh, encourage any of you to, if you're down that way. And, and it's now BB's burial site, as you probably know. Uh, and I and I just I would like to add that uh, two months ago, uh, in the elections there in Sunflower County, 
uh, there were, um, example, like County has a predominantly black population, which 75% are over, but they elected their first black chancery clerk, first black circuit clerk, first uh, pre uh, uh, predominantly black, a uh, majority black, a board of supervisors, and they reelected the black sheriff and and they reelected, uh, or they elected a, a black tax assessor collector, not the first, but uh, uh, schools are, are still uh, very segregated. Uh, most of the white students go to private academies. Uh, the economy is uh, still predominantly agricultural and uh, too much poverty uh, persists, but uh, uh, there are a lot of positive things happening. And I, I'd just like to uh, say that the East, that Senator Eastland left behind a really fine family. And his son, Woods, who uh, was named after the senator's mm -hmm. father, uh, uh, a very, uh, who graduated from law school here at Ole Miss, Woods uh, recently retired after a successful career as uh, heading uh, Staple Cotton and, uh, and running the family, the family farm. But he's been a, a supporter of that $14 million B.B. King Museum, and he's on the board of directors. And, uh, you know, some might say the irony, uh, and, you know, but we have such a rich history here in Mississippi, and, and, uh, and, and Martin, you have helped document it, and I, I appreciate it. I think we all appreciate it. I think, let's all give him a round. <laughs>